Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of KISS Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. This week's topic is a bit technical, but important for growers to consider whether you have two plants or 2,000. My guest this week is Cassandra Maffey, and she shares her experience with creating and utilizing standard operating procedures or SOPs in your garden. Cassandra is a legacy cannabis cultivator who specializes in commercial scale organic living soil cultivation. She honed her cultivation skills in the early 2000s in Northern California's Emerald Triangle, then relocated to Colorado to co-found one of Boulder's first licensed dispensaries in 2009. Since then, she has helped clients across the country establish successful commercial scale living soil cannabis cultivation facilities, working with medical, recreational, and celebrity brands. Cassandra's passion for sustainability and quality has won numerous cannabis cups and accolades for her teams, and Cassandra was named one of the top 50 women in cannabis by High Times Magazine in 2019. Cassandra was kind enough to share a sample SOP as an example on our podcast page. Now on to the show. Hey, Cassandra, thanks for coming on the show today. It's great to be here, Tad. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you. Uh... Can you tell me a little bit about yourself to share with listeners, please? Sure. Yeah, I started out as a cultivator um, in the year 2000. Uh, I moved down to Humboldt County, and there I learned outdoor cultivation, indoor cultivation. Um, Eventually, I moved to Colorado um, to found one of the first vertically integrated licensed cannabis dispensaries there, and I've been working in the industry ever since. Awesome. Awesome. And you and I have had a lot of uh, really enjoyable conversations off air about a variety of topics. And um, one of the things that we talked about uh, that we thought would be a, would be a good podcast topic was SOPs. Um, there is something that I think are really challenging for a lot of facilities and commercial growers Um, Even having SOPs as a home grower, I think, or a tent grower could be beneficial. Um, How how do you approach something like that that can be really daunting for a lot of people? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, so you're absolutely correct that growers, no matter if you are growing in a closet or you're operating a 50,000 square foot facility, just wrapping your head around the processes and the materials that you need for every single cycle um, is, is just really ha- it's really helpful to just get organized. Um, it means you know what the tasks are going to be ahead of you. Um, you know what materials you're going to need. And so you're not in the middle of trying to do something and you're like, oh, crap, I have to go to the store or order this thing. Um, so you can feel really prepared. Um, and... You know, and then another piece to it also is that if you don't really get that basic foundational uh, calendar and those processes organized, then it's really hard to know when you innovate what whether like what it was that worked for you or didn't work for you. Um, and so, you know, I think it's really good to start with a calendar. So. Just wrap, if you, if you look at it like your SOPs, your standard operating procedures are a being. Um, the calendar is sort of your skeleton. So you want to know exactly how long it takes you to root clones or to germinate seeds. And then you want to know, okay, um, like I actually break down veg into three phases. Um, and I know exactly how long those are. And I have different things that I'm going to be doing to the plants during that period of time. Um, You know, and then I also break flower down into three separate cycles or three, three phases. Um, And then I want to know, well, how long does it take me to harvest? How long does it take me to dry? Um, And then, you know, what does trimming look like? And then how long do I need to cure? So, you know, all in all, that gives you like a great skeleton to start filling in details. 
yeah, you sort of piqued my interest. Um, what? How do you break down veg and flour into three sections, and what are those three sections? I mean, they don't have very uh, special names, but okay. So you know, so in veg, I mean, there's there's actually four um, because I've got my rooting phase, um, my veg phase one, veg phase two, veg phase three. And I like to veg for about eight weeks. So I do a, a really long veg compared to many people. Yeah. Um, but in that process, um, you know, veg phase one, those are like little, little baby seedlings or little baby, baby clones. And so they've just been transplanted. I really need to make sure that they're not getting overwatered. Right. Um, they really, you know, they don't need any additional nutrients maybe you know they they do need to be really carefully inspected for pests um you know there's some basic pruning and training um practices that you can do at that point um veg phase two is like really really vigorous growth um i need to make sure that during that period of time if i'm going to send my plants into flower i need to make sure that they're totally healthy and pest free in that veg phase two because, you know, as we all know, if you send sick plants into flower, you're never going to have a great result with that. Um, so, you know, so that really, really focuses on, like, that's where the bulk of the IPM happens for me, is that veg phase two. And then veg phase three, we're resolving anything that might have happened in veg phase two and doing a lot of pruning and training to prepare for transplant. So that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I mean, breaking it down into like what you're focusing on in each of those phases, I think just makes it easier to know what to prioritize because as growers, like we have a million things that we're thinking about, a million things that we want to do. And if you're like, all right, my goal during this phase of growth is IPM, like, Mm-hmm. that's what you're going to prioritize like every single day. So, so that's why I find it helpful. And then, you know, flower phase one, again, I need to do any additional pruning during that phase before pistols emerge. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm making sure that my canopies, you know, I grow in giant raised soil beds, um, like you and a lot of your listeners. And so I need to make sure that that entire canopy is prepared to be productive and filled out and even during that veg phase one. Um, And then veg phase two, we're just making sure, or excuse me, flower phase two, um, you know, again, that's really, really vigorous growth. And so I'm looking for plant health cues, making sure that there's enough nutrition available to my plants. Again, checking for pests and just making sure that everything's really clean and healthy. And then that flower phase three is when we're getting ready for the end. You know, at that phase, you really, really want to check for, um, you know, particularly if you're growing a greenhouse, botrytis or, or outdoors, checking for botrytis, checking for any clues that um, your plants might need to come down a little early or might be going a little bit later. So, um, so that's kind of how. That makes sense. I can see that. Um, and so I guess it's not so much about how long each phase is, but just having something in your head that syncs up with your cultivation schedule. Um, because like you said, not everyone veges for eight weeks, for example, but you could do the exact same thing on a shorter timeline, I would assume, and, and get similar results, um, provided that works. So. As you're creating your SOP, so uh, I'm sorry, I'm all over the place here a little bit, but um, I, I think about the fact that like when I walk into a facility, it's very easy to get distracted. And so if you don't have a list of things that you need to accomplish that day or that week, um, it'd be very easy to forget to do it. Um, how do you go about sort of prioritizing those things on your SOP as you're, as you're building it out? What's sort of your framework for that? So the framework, um, uh, I don't know if, if you're familiar with Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, it's applied to humans, 
you can apply it to any living organism at all. And so, you know, obviously that food, water, shelter, or environmental stability, you know, for your plants is going to be the most important thing. Um, I think superseding anything else, it's helpful to begin with a daily walkthrough and you're looking for, you know, number one, is there anything that's come up in, in cultivation, like automated watering systems break all the time. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I mean, air conditioning units, dehumidifiers, all these things are like constantly breaking for us because we use them so, so hard in cultivation. And so um, each day needs to begin with a daily walkthrough. And then you're just determining, okay, like, do my plants have enough food and water? And is or are the environmental conditions um, acceptable for Um, those things obviously need to be addressed first and foremost. Um, Beyond that, I do have, like, I flesh out the calendar. So I actually, you know, I give to my grow team, like, a harvest batch notebook, which fills in every single day, like, okay, so if we're going to be hand-watering, you know, there are these three days that those, you know, that the growers are scheduled to water. However, they know that if the soil is too wet, you need to push it to the next day. But we have these mm-hmm. floating tasks that, you know, are those basics from, you know, again, it's, it's really just providing, you know, food, water, shelter for our plants. Um, and then if an emergency comes up and, and we, we maybe shift around a day or two. Um, there are other things where, we know that, um, you know, we don't want to be doing a lot of pruning, like, in the middle of flower, for instance. Like, I've seen that really stress plants out, um, you know, overall uh, lower productivity, um, lower yields, um, you know, hermaphrodites in the worst case. So I want to make sure that, that all that is done before um, really, you know, day 21 the last day of flower that I would allow any <laughs> significant pruning to be happening. Um, and so that's, again, on the calendar. And it's good to think about those things. I mean, so if you break it into chunks, you know, okay, so, you know, from a, a seedling or a rooted clone, you're going to need to transplant it by this day. If you don't, mm-hmm. the roots are going to start, you know, especially with clones, they're going to start tangling and braiding with one another. Um, that causes all kinds of problems later on. So you just put it in your calendar. Okay, so in an, in an ideal situation, I would be transplanting a clone, you know, between the 10th and the 12th day. And so you know that's on your calendar, whether it's a printed calendar or dry erase or on your phone or whatever. It's there ahead of time, so you know the week before that you're prepared with all of your materials and, and you kind of wrap your head around, okay, well, what are the things that I need? I need so many, you know, I transplant directly into three gallon pots and bed and then they go into uh, the raised beds and, and flower. And so I know I need X amount of three gallon pots. I need this much soil. I've calculated how much soil is going to be in, in each pot. Um, and this is what I'm going to be watering in with. This is the that I brew and this is what I'll be watering in with. So on the day of that 10 to 12th day, I have all the materials right there. And I know what to do and I and if I've got folks helping me, then I can say, you know, everybody's trained in the same SOP. So we talk about it, go over it for you know, just a couple minutes. Um, make sure that whoever's working with you is empowered to know exactly what that process is. And then we can all just, like, work together, bust it out, no stress. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is you're you're kind of using a calendar system uh, with important dates on the calendar. But then it sounds like you're also referencing some sort of document that has maybe more details in it or step-by-step instructions on some of these, you know, essential tasks like, transplanting, watering, scouting, 
uh, things like that. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, so every single process, every single task that we do in the garden should have its own SOP. Um, and then you can compile that into your SOP manual that has, I mean, my SOP manual has like over 350 different singular SOPs. Um, and obviously that's not something that that most growers will ever even need to do, like that level of, of specificity. But if you start doing this for a really long time or or leading a pretty large team, you want to make sure that that all of that knowledge is, is just in one place. So if I'm going to draft a singular SOP, let's say for transplanting, the first thing that I'm going to have on there would be um, when it needs to happen. So that time when mm-hmm. I'm saying, okay, with the clone, I need to make sure that that is um, you know, between day 10, 12. Um, and these are the materials that I need. So I list all of the materials that are needed. Um, Also, I mean, things like specifying, okay, so if you're going to be transplanting clones, I specify that that hose needs to be clean. You know, I mean, that's like one of those things where if someone was just reading your SOP, um, what if they take a filthy garden hose that's been outside or, you know, something that just hasn't been cleaned in a, a, you know, a bunch. It's had some uh, you know, maybe old water from a, a nutrient feed in it, you know, like who knows, there's like some old kelp water <laughs> stuck in that hose. We could really mess things up if the hose isn't clean. So um, all of your materials and then specify like anything that, you know, might be special about that. Clean scissors are also a good one, not just any old grubby uh, pair of scissors. And then I go, okay, step one, unplug the cloner, you know, evaluate the roots, uh, take an inventory of, you know, how many plants you have. Um, Then it goes into, you know, making sure that the pots are labeled. Um, This is how we prepare the soil. This is the inoculant that we use. Um, and then going into every step of transplanting. Um, and so that can be just a single one-page document if you're that kind of person. Um, I mm-hmm. go into a deep dive to make sure that if I was across the country, someone could read this and understand like every little potential pitfall that you could experience while transplanting. Like you open up a bag of soil and it's hydrophobic. That happens sometimes. Well, then you need to stop. And so I say, okay, stop at this phase. Plug the cloner back Mm -hmm. in and and then go to this SOP to, um, you know, rehydrate the soil and then return. So you, yours are pretty extensive from what I'm hearing, um, which may or may not be necessary uh, depending on uh, the type of grow that you have or the facility or your personality, but, um, it certainly doesn't hurt. I, I do think though, that having a system that's replicable, like you're saying, so everyone, even if it's just you are transplanting the same way and thinking through that process, you may find you can cut steps out or there's things that you were doing that you didn't need to do. Um, but also if you do it the same every time, now you have an, the ability to compare data sets and say, okay, well, this cycle I transplant this way. Well, if the next cycle you transplant a different way, it's really hard to know what kind of differences and results, what they're related to, I guess. So um, I do really like that aspect of, of SOPs. I think that's really important. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and that's, um, you know, I, I'm sure that that's something also that your team experiences when doing like any sort of crop consultation with growers is that um, you can help people who really know what their baseline is. Um, If you understand what all of their inputs are because they know what they are, they, you know, it's written down, they can communicate them to you. Then that makes it a lot easier for you to say, okay, 
well, I can see where you maybe went wrong here. Maybe this is why we're, you know, seeing a crazy amount of magnesium pop up in your soil or whatever it is, you know, or this is what seems like pH has just, you know, uh, plummeted. And, you know, it seems like, gosh, you've got a lot of nitrogen in your soil. So if you know what that baseline is, it makes it a lot easier for people to help you when you run into trouble. Um, No, that's, that's a really good point. (laughs) Yeah. I love that because coming in from the outside mid cycle and getting a list of everything that's been, uh, been added as an input is really helpful in trying to figure out what's going on. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I, I a hundred percent agree with that. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, and then there are, you know, some additional things too, that I think sometimes people forget, um, you know, there that when you're talking about ferments, you know, and, and, um, you know, I, I think a a lot of your listeners and, and certainly, you know, you and me might prefer, to have the bulk of nutrition be present in the soil from the beginning. Um, But then when you get into adding, uh, you know, liquid feeds, whether that's, I mean, teas, even dilute teas have like substantial, you know, nutritive content. And, And oftentimes, like if you've gathered a bunch of plants and you've got like some horsetail and you've got, you know, this and that and rose hips and like, you know, whoever, you know, who knows what else, it can be really difficult then to understand, um, okay, so like, how do we, how do we move in the right direction if, if, if you don't even know exactly what, what has been in those teas or those ferments, you know, as additional component. Um, and I've noticed like when I've worked with uh, various teams, they might give me their feed schedule but it doesn't even include those teats. Mm-hmm. And so it's like an additional just wild card that um, hasn't really been accounted for. The idea is that it's good for biology, but there's more to it than that. So, you know, and some people like in the case of, um, you know, FPJ or something like that, maybe the growers harvesting different input materials every single time with really varied results. Well, it's going to be difficult for me or for you, your team, to come in and say, okay, I know how that affected everything. Um, you know, and half the time we won't, you know, if it isn't in the SOPs, if it's not referenced directly, it, it makes it even harder. Yeah, I think you bring up a really important point in the sense that these a lot of teas and ferments do bring in a level of mineral nutrition that people don't account for. And so if we're accounting for the total load of nitrogen, for example, that we think a plant is going to need in its life cycle, and then you add a bunch of teas, well, like you said, that's going to drop the pH, maybe outside of a range that we want. It's going to provide more nitrates than we may want the plant to have at various stages um, and could limit uptake of other nutrients. So um, all of these things have a place and I'm not against them, but it's important to account for them. And do realize that as you add more of these things, you are adding more variability. And so when you do have a problem going back and looking at the 10 different T applications you made, it's really hard to determine what was beneficial and what caused problems. Um, so I always like to start from a baseline. That's very simple, you know, as little as possible. Sometimes I'm like, Hey, just, just start with water, get an idea for how the soil is going to perform and then add from there, you know, one at a time and get an idea of if this thing, if this is beneficial or not, and then figure out what the limiting factor of a plant growth it is that this is actually addressing. You know, if you're adding calcium and you already have sufficient calcium, then it's not doing you any favors. Um, so you really have to watch that. Yeah, I mean, then and, and I mean, wouldn't it be cool to start out with, OK, let's, you know, you've, you know, even in a small like grow tent, you could go ahead and do a side by side, essentially using like two or three different SOPs at the same time. OK, so, you know, I'm going to have the water only bed here and I'm going to, you know, utilize, um, you know, these teas in the second one 
and, you know, and and this and the third one. And so, you know, I, I love that idea of starting really simple and just adding from that. But I think, you know, it can be so difficult if we don't write these things down, if we don't collect data, you know, from every single thing we've done through a harvest, it's so hard to go back later and know what you did. It's really hard to keep track of that, even even if it's in a grow tent. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's important to keep track of um, when you water, if you're hand watering, what those days are uh, to track that. And, and you may be surprised with how that ends up. If you're actually tracking the plant, you may be surprised with how that correlates to your plant health. Um, I like to also track, like you said, every application that you're making of any microbial or nutrient or spray, um, you know, track when you prune, track your scouting and, and keep track of any insect pressures that you see, because all of that information is really helpful over time in figuring out what's going on and, and how you can improve things. Absolutely. I mean, and, and it can be as high tech or as low tech as you want, you know, it, for a bunch of years, like a dry erase calendar was enough for me. You know, you can get those dry erase calendars that are, you know, three or four months long. And then it's like, okay, so at the beginning of my harvest cycle, I'm like, all right, so I'm cloning from, you know, here to here. And there's enough room to just write like a couple little notes on that dry erase calendar about what I actually did. So in one color, I've got what I plan to do in another color. You know, I write down what I actually did. And then at the end of the harvest, you can just take a picture with your phone. Um, Mm -hmm. So that would be like an ultra low tech way of doing it. But then if you've got a question like six months later, then you can just like pull it up in your phone and be like, oh, yeah, that's what I did. And that's what worked or that's what didn't work, I think. Yeah, there's a lot of tools out there. Um, they're not all helpful or necessary. It's really a balance I've found over with, with my business at KISS. Um, like we use Slack and that works really well for us. But that doesn't – it it works well for day-to-day communication, but it doesn't work well for tracking things. So if, if I need to follow up with someone uh, two weeks from now, that's not a very good tool. Um, or if there's something I want to look at and then come back to later, it, it's not very useful. So uh, we use a combination of Slack, uh, either a Google Calendar or Apple Calendar, some sort of calendar where we can put things on there that'll send us alerts. Um, and then uh, I guess those are our main things. And then we have SOPs as a separate document that we keep. Um, and then if it were a grow, I would want another document to track all of the things that you're talking about, just putting, putting it into a database, but I don't want to collect data just for the sake of collecting data. I want to have an idea prior to starting any plants of what I'm going, what I want to collect data for, like what the goals are for that data. So I can make sure that it's usable and I'm not just wasting my time too. Yeah. I mean, and, and perhaps, you know, like a, a helpful way to do that is, um, you know, so you collect all this data during the course of, of a harvest batch. And then you, know, you want, ultimately, you know, at the end, everybody's going to know, okay, this was my yield. And this was the overall quality. And so those are two, like, super, super basic things that we're, you know, growers are going to pay attention to every single time. Um, you know, if you're a home grower, you don't necessarily have, you know, access to potency testing or things like that. But obviously, if you're a commercial grower, you will. And so, you know, at the end of, of every harvest, I sit down with my team and I say, you know, we review that harvest batch notebook. So every every single thing we did, and then we say, okay, so we have been tracking the yields of all these different strains, so, you know, in any given facility and you know i work with a number of different facilities but in every single one we're we're keeping data on you know this strain and what its average yield is and so if i say you know we'll shoot like our average yield like went down you know by uh you know so many grams per square foot this round like let's let's look at why And we could say, oh, well, it was just an environmental thing because we can see here, okay, 
the air conditioning broke from, you know, this time to this time, plant health suffered, it was documented. Okay, well, that makes sense. You know, we can evaluate some other things. Um, but then we're also going to track soil tests. Um, I think it's really important, especially if you're reusing your media to test, you know, I, I like to send in soil tests at least like seven to 10 days before harvest. So I kind of get this is what the end of harvest looks like. And then once I've reamended, um, then I can also send um, at the beginning of the next batch, I can get a sense for like, okay, I've reamended and this is what the soil test looks like. So comparing those, and then if you're seeing like some sort of anomaly with your soil test results, that's another, I mean, you know, hopefully you can catch that before yield is ever affected. Um, but again, you know, if you see an anomaly in your results, then you can go ahead and look back through your data to understand why. That sounds great. Yeah. So um, maybe the next question I would have around SOPs would be, uh, where do you where do you start? Like if you didn't have if you had a blank page and you were thinking about starting this process, where would you start? Definitely start with that calendar. So and then you need to, to just mentally walk yourself through every single thing that you do throughout the course of a harvest, um, you know, and, and you can even start on the fly, like as you're like, okay, so you've never written anything down before. Okay. Well, with your next harvest batch start, you know, okay. So today I'm cloning and these are the things that I'm doing. And you just make sure that you write it down, you know, and then, you know, okay. And it's Tuesday. I walked through, you know, I evaluated the pH and the, the, you know, cloner, or I, you know, um, or I checked for roots on the peat plug or, you know, whatever it is. And so you're just, you just write down what you do. Um, and then it makes it, you know, really easy for the next time to just look through and be like, okay, so this is what, you know, this is what my schedule is going to look like. And then just every time you can like add a little bit of detail here and there, um, if something comes to mind, it's, you know, it's really easy to just add something in. Um, you know, again, you can do something really simple and just have it be on a dry erase calendar. But, you know, I have a Word document for mine um, just because it makes it easy to, you know, edit, um, share, uh, and, and uh, you know, just keeps it a little bit more organized. You know, and I've got a, uh, a table of contents that I can just click through exactly what I need. Yeah. Have you had a chance to read uh, The Lean Farm by Ben Hartman or um, any of the lean manufacturing stuff with Toyota coming out of Japan? I Yeah, I, I, I've read, um, you know, the well, I've read The Lean Startup. Um, the the lean farm uh is is on my my list to read oh, okay yeah it, that book was really great for me because i was familiar with sort of lean principles um but i couldn't figure out how it really applied to cultivation and ben applying it to a small market farm really allowed it to click for me and i did an interview with him years ago now um and he's got a lot of resources out there but the highlights for me that really stuck were um thinking about efficiency so mapping how like for example if there's a task that i'm doing uh let's say transplanting how many steps am i taking you know moving throughout the facility to have to get all the materials together you know is my is my soil in one place and the pots over here and I'm constantly having to take extra steps. So they may, he makes like a spaghetti diagram of all of your, all the steps you take in a day kind of drawn out to complete a task. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, another thing that he, he looked at was, um, Oh, how do we, how do we take these principles and apply them, um, specifically to a farm thing. So he has a whole mobile stand that goes around with him that has all the tools that he's going to need to complete that task, whether it's harvesting lettuce or transplanting. And so those, those things all stay together. And then he has photos up 
so you could walk into an area and see a picture of what that area is supposed to look like um, when it's clean. So that at the end of the day, anyone who walks up could make that area look exactly how it's supposed to. And so you're always starting from the same point too. And those those key thing, metrics were like really helpful for me in thinking about how I might do a better job of you know, setting up processes and SOPs. Well, and I think that also brings up a really good point about uh, that will be more and more relevant to cannabis is GMP or good manufacturing um, practices or good agricultural practices, GAP certification, um, where you don't double back. So like it's an efficiency thing too, but it's also, you know, really important for pest management um, and reducing contamination within facilities is to make sure that your processes, you're not doubling back constantly because not only does that waste your time and, you know, take more effort, but it also, you know, if you're in an area that has some sort of like significant pest pressure and then you're moving into, you know, a common area and then back and then, you know, into your nursery, um, then you're basically spreading contamination throughout your facility. So... Absolutely. We always want to start in our areas that need to stay the cleanest or that are our cleanest and end the day in places that are the dirtiest or can't afford to be the dirtiest. Um, Meaning our mother plants and our veg plants cloning, those have to be pest free. Um, There's just no way to have a good facility otherwise. And then moving through the rest of the rest of the place if you have if you know you have thrips in room three that's the very last place that you want to visit at the end of the day so you're not like you said doubling back um and and it's just very inefficient like i i had a seven acre farm and i would walk around that thing so much because i'd get to the back and be like okay i want to weed this area back here and i'd get back there and be like oh shoot i forgot my bucket now i gotta walk all the way back up to the front and i get back up there and like oh i forgot my you know something and and so i'm doing 10 minutes, 15 minutes of walking just to complete a, a silly task or start a task that could have been really avoided. And, and <laughs> I'll be honest, like uh, now I think about it with everything I do, um, even at home now, I'll be like, okay, and, and this is fine. I'll be like, um, all right, my, my toilet paper, I want to keep near my toilet. Like I don't want it on the other side of of the space because that's just inefficient. So I can take five steps to get to the toilet paper instead of, you know, 20, depending on where it is in my house. And like all of these things can just be made more efficient if we just take a moment to think about, about them. And I love that. But we both have toddlers. So, you know, that toilet paper could be anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> that's very true. Very true. Um, yeah. And, you know, your life does not have to be hyper efficient, but I do think, you know, the things that we can do to make our cultivation facility um, more efficient it is is crucial, especially when you have so many different things going on all the time throughout the day, um, which is another reason why these SOPs are so important, because you really do have to prioritize your time or the next thing you know, you'll end up spending half the day doing something that wasn't even on your list um, and you don't have the ability. So let's say you're Let's say your air conditioner breaks. Well, now you're being pulled away from all the things that were on your mental checklist of things to do. Um, If you have an SOP, you can hand those off to someone else to complete your list so you can go deal with the air conditioner. And that's just really common, I feel like, in commercial facilities. You're always putting out fires. Um, So the more organization you have, the better. Yeah, you know, and and I think the beauty about being able to hand off your SOPs to someone, too, is that... um, it can also show your team that you trust them. Um, like, so I saw so often, you know, in the early days of uh, licensed commercial cultivation, I noticed that so many of my peers were like jealously guarding their knowledge. Um, and so they had these teams who, you know, maybe worshiped this like grower, like a guru. They were so amazing, you know, but at the end of the day, like these people weren't learning how to run facilities themselves, you know, ultimately they were going to be limited by this teacher gatekeeper who was not going to entrust them with key information. It was always going to be a little secretive. They could never really know the secret Mm -hmm. sauce. Um, you know, and, 
and think about what what kind of culture that creates in your facility. You know, um, I know that traditionally, you know, a lot of teachers have really jealously guarded their knowledge, but um, I know I've really enjoyed working with my teams because, you know, as they move up and they're able to take care of their own facility, or let's say it means that I get to step away and work on another project because this person over here is now, you know, proficient enough and skilled enough to take the, the simple foundation of SOPs that, that I created, and then they can run their own garden over here, you know, and, and in many cases, you know, they can add a couple things that, that make it their own. But um, I think having a, a culture of empowered people who are actually able to help you when you're putting out fires or, you know, or just be able to, you know, as a teacher, enjoy seeing people learning new things and, um, you know, and maybe looking at an SOP and being like, hey, could we maybe change this one thing? I think it would be more efficient to do this, you know, and sometimes you'll be like, no, that won't work. But other times you'll be like, yeah, (laughs) yeah, that would, you know, it would be so much more efficient if we did it this way. And so I think having extra pairs of eyes on your SOPs can be a really beautiful thing, too. And it's not something to be afraid of. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I will say that being a good grower does not necessarily mean that you're a good teacher or a good manager. Like I know one of my limitations is I'm not good at managing large groups of people. When we had the farm fully running with 20, 25 people on staff, uh, that wasn't a skill set that I really excelled at. Um, and, and so you know, I don't want to say that all growers don't jealously guard their SOPs. I think some growers just aren't as organized and some growers are just very intuitive and, you know, can walk into a room and see what needs to be done because they have this mental checklist, but they haven't taken the time to necessarily organize it or get it on the paper, um, which is sort of what you're talking about is if you have if you have that tool, um, it's a very useful tool to be able to share with a team for, for growers that are, you know, head growers or, or running a facility. And it is empowering to be able to share that totally. Well, and, and actually, I mean, you know, like. I'm old school. And so in, you know, in the early days of cultivation, um, what we had like Jorge Cervantes book, which was like the only piece of information, you know, we really had available to us. And then, you know, okay, we could, um, you know, take information from unrelated crops and integrate them into our cultivation system. But, you know, <laughs> no one was, there's, was, there's was no soil testing happening um you know there you know we were working blind and so a lot of it for me was intuitive for many many years and I got along like that you know just great until I had to lead a team and I think that um you know if I had one message to aspiring cultivators people who really really want to do this as a career in which they can retire you're going to need to be able to take those, you know, take your, your knowledge, your, your skill set, and get it organized enough that you can share with other people. Um, I do, I guess, caution cultivators once you, if, if you draft your SOPs and then you're offered your dream job, don't sign away your IP <laughs> to whatever company recruits you. Um, mm-hmm. You can, there are a bunch of ways in your contract that you can share that IP with them. Um, you know, you can usually get some money up front in your contract for supplying those SOPs. Um, but don't, uh, don't give up your right to use them in any way you want in the future. That would be my one caution where in that particular case, you should be careful of what you share with Yeah, two thoughts on that. So one, I, I totally agree. And I think that SOPs have value, as in monetary value, because there's a lot of time and energy and experience. There's a lot of failures and, and wins that go into creating your SOPs for, for anyone that's gone through that process. Uh, and that has value. Um, 
whether whether it's yours or mine or you know even if you're in a tent and so i think that's important to protect that um i will say though that as a commercial facility if you're looking for someone because you want help with sops you can't just go buy an off-the-shelf sop and think it's going to work perfectly in your facility there there's so many intricacies to every facility that makes them different that i think some like broad strokes absolutely a lot of that stuff's going to be the same, but, but individually, there's just too many little things that need to be kind of dialed in at your facility. I mean, what do you think about that? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, cause for sure, like the SOPs that I use in, I mean, it's a little bit more similar in like an indoor facility to an indoor facility, but then indoor to greenhouse mm. is you have to make a ton of adjustments. But even if you're working in like a very similar, uh, you know, a similar facility to indoor facilities, for instance, the HVAC is going to be different. So, you know, in facility A, let's say that's like some old ghetto infrastructure and the SOPs need to be built. All the processes that we do are sort of compensating for that. Um, HVAC that could die at any moment. Whereas, like, okay, facility B, it's state of the art. Things, you know, it's just been built out. Um, you know, HVAC is different. Lighting is different, and there are going to be a bunch of adjustments made. Um, you know, even so, I think that there are a number of things that can stay the same. But yeah, it's it's it's. It's important never to fall asleep at the wheel thinking you've got mm-hmm. the SOP, <laughs> the SOP manual uh, to rule all others. Because even if you get it really right in one system, there's always something you can do better. And I think, you know, again, now that we have information or access to so much more data, we can, especially with living soil growers, we can hone our system better and better all the time. Because, I mean, like, I'm still learning tons. I've basically been running a system that's it's very similar for 20 years. But, you know, even so, it's like I'm learning more and more and more all the time and integrating that into the system. So it's really important not to get complacent. Oh, absolutely. I'm learning new things every day. That's what I love about this industry. Um, and I think it makes it makes me a better grower or cultivator um, over time as I, as I keep learning. So your SOPs are a constantly evolving document, like you said, and I think that's important for people to think about. And then one other thing that I, that we haven't touched on that I think is important is having an SOP around every type of pest. So once you've properly identified fungus, gnats, root aphids, fusarium, whatever it is that you're dealing with, having a, a, a targeted plan, before this happens is really, really helpful. Um, so you, you're not just feeling not only just overwhelmed and behind the gun, but you, you, you have a plan moving forward that you've already sort of established as a team or even just for yourself. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and even better is if you can provide visuals, just like you were talking, it's like, you know, providing a picture of a room that's clean I mean, I think, uh, you know, if if you can provide your team with a visual, like this is what a fungus gnat looks like. Um, you know, I even had some pictures. It's like, this is a fungus gnat. It looks like a, you know, it, it. if you're not looking closely, it can look like an aphid. Here are the different pictures. Like, here's, you know, how you can properly identify this. Um, and then, yeah, having an SOP for like, Okay, so if any pest is found, we're going to, like I call it, you know, code orange. Um, Anything arises, it's like, okay, so immediately we're going to be more hygienic as we move throughout the facility. We're going to be suiting up. We're going to be extra careful about our tools, um, things like that. Um, But then, yeah, having having those SOPs for every single pest or, or pathogen that comes up is, it's it just makes it so much easier to respond. And, you know, if you're catching this in, like, flower, you only have so much time to respond. You know, and and also there's how you might respond in veg versus how you might respond in flower. 
Oh yeah, very different. You have very limited tools by the time you get to, you know, flower or even your mid flower, you're pretty much done spraying at that point. So there's not a lot of things that you can use in your arsenal. Uh, so keeping pest pressure low up until that point is, is crucial. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's sort of a side note and not as related to, um, you know, I, I actually put this in my SOPs for um, potential clients. So when they're building out a facility, I have some SOPs for clients to help guide them through that process. And one of those components is I highly recommend each, if you could do it, each uh, flowering harvest batch should be in its own room or bay, if at all possible. Because then if a pest arises in flower, yeah, you shouldn't be spraying. You just, you just shouldn't, um, you know, regardless of whether, you know, uh, a certain pesticide or fungicide has been approved for use or not. There are just so many, there's so many things that we don't know. Um, and I'm not sure that I'm, um, you know, entirely confident in um, the safety of pesticides that are combusted. Um, and, and what those might do and, and how they've been evaluated. So um, in any case, I think, you know, best practice, don't spray and flower, you know, certainly not when you have, um, you know, significant pistols that have already emerged. And then if a pest arise, it arises, you can kind of ride it out in that case. Um, that's just going to be the very last room you go to. And you might need to, to actually just like harvest in the room and never, you know, never take that material into your common trim space or whatever. Yeah, good points. Good points. Well, was there anything else around this topic that you wanted to share that I didn't ask you about? Um, you know, I think um, I think one of the um, the cautionary the cautionary um, like pieces I have with SOPs um, like so on social media I see a lot of people asking for an SOP for blank and just know that every single system is going to be vastly different um, you know, also to be really careful because I've seen a number of manufacturers put out information that um, that isn't accurate. And so, you know, even in the living soil community, um, you know, there are manufacturers that are probably really well-meaning, um, but they might um, suggest a feed that's really high in arsenic. You and I have talked about this offline. It's like, there are yeah. some inputs out there, even by um, companies that have like pretty significant followings um, that may cause you to fail for heavy metals. Um, and so don't just trust someone else's process ever. Um, you know, it's really, really important to evaluate whether it works for your system um, and also just know there's like a lot of BS out there too. That's just, <laughs> it's just people, you know, generating content to, you know, get more followers, more likes. And so I think you just need to be really savvy about that. And again, you know, even some of those people are like the cool kids in cannabis. And, um, you know, I think that even though a lot of uh, more mature growers will say like, you know, I might see these things and I don't want to call somebody out on social media, but know that there's like a huge community of people with a lot more experience who see these comments and just sort of cringe because, well, I might not personally want to get into a battle with somebody about, you know, this potentially risky practice that they're suggesting to growers. Um, mm -hmm. I see it out there all the time. So I just, you know, just, just, Always keep, always be cautious about the information that you see, um, you know, that, that um, you know, that you see in social media or, or on the internet or even from like reputable teachers, um, you know, just, 
just never stop asking questions. And I think the most reputable uh, folks to work with are people who will encourage your questions. Yeah, I think I think you said it well. It's a tough topic because you don't want to be the bad guy um, either, <laughs> at least not publicly. Um, yeah, and, and I think also looking is is the education that you're getting from this company, is it product-based or is it educational that gives you the tools to actually improve your growing process without those products? And and that's something people, I think, can take a little closer look at too. Um, I just did a podcast with uh, uh, Michael Brownbridge from BioWorks. He's a pathologist over there. And they were looking at Bavaria from various companies. Uh, and some of these companies, like one in particular in the Living Soil Game, is selling Bavaria where the spore count is so low that it's, it would be impossible to get any efficacy. But yet, you know, if you were to go online and look at the reviews of the product and, and, and such, you would think that it was highly effective. So you're, you're right. There's a big difference between marketing and sales and, and what actually works or what's actually best practice. And I think as an industry, you know, I'd like to say we're going to get there, but that's kind of dominated the cannabis industry since the advanced nutrients days way back, uh, you know, 20, 20, 30 years ago now. So, um, I, I think it'll always be there. And I think folks just need to be really, like you said, discerning and, and think about what they're hearing and question things from everyone. Yeah. And, you know, and again, like the, the more simple approach with really simple inputs, like it's been successful for growers for a really, really long time. And I have never found like one particular commercial product, like formulated product that was like a silver bullet, you know, I've, I've never, you know, whether it's like an, a microbial inoculant, whether it's a pesticide or a fungicide, or I don't care what it is. Like I, I really mm -hmm. haven't found um, anything that is as magical as marketing would have us believe or that works in every single instance. So, you know, I think, I think the more you can focus on those core SOPs, those, core really simple inputs you can build a system that's really strong and then you can play with the products you know you don't have to rely on them and you don't have to spend a million dollars on them you know you can just see where whether they work yeah and speaking of what works like i get emails from people or photos and and they're they're crushing it right they're real happy with their program um their sops may not be the same as mine like they may be doing things that i don't necessarily choose to do like i don't choose to cover crop indoors and i have my reasons why but that's not to say there aren't people out there doing it successfully um and so at the end of the day if your sop is working for you and you're happy with what you're spending on your crop um who am i to tell you otherwise i have a guy that sent me photos of his greenhouse and he encourages weeds and he loves it and his plants look great and you know, for him, that's an ecosystem that's working really well, um, is sort of in communion. And I was like, great, <laughs> you know, that's working for you. Here's the reasons where I think you could get into trouble. But at the end of the day, uh, it's just an opinion. And, and if you're growing happy, healthy plants, that's that's what we're all going for in the end. So, um, yeah, I don't I don't want people to get too caught up in, like you said, that there's this perfect SOP for everyone or that one person's right, that person's wrong. It's like. I think you can look at ways to, to grow more cost effectively. Um, and that's something you could explore, even if you're growing great plants, that maybe that's the next step, but, but yeah, I, you know, do what you want. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and, and that's what, you know, that's where the, the art of growing comes into play. Um, you know, I don't think there should be any just, you know, single right way, um, and I think if you also are enjoying what you're doing, if you're having fun with it and you're passionate about it, you're going to always put in the extra effort to to make your plants healthy. And I think that that's like a secret ingredient that that can't be overlooked. Yeah, I, I agree. I really appreciate you taking the time today to share some of your thoughts around this. And maybe we can connect again on other other topics uh, from a grower perspective, which is what I think you really bring to the table. And I, I love that. Well, great. I'm, I'm really honored you'd have me on the show.
That was Cassandra Maffey, and you are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey. If you like the podcast, please leave us a rating and review and give us a follow on Instagram. You can also sign up for our newsletter on our website homepage to stay up to date on the latest research and information. Thanks for listening.